this is an exciting one. So the five-fold ministry, when I first came on board last October, the only two things that I knew uh, in saying, yes, I will run this church, the only two things I knew for sure was, one, we're going to get this to a new building. Like, we're going we're gonna to make the living room happen. We're going to find a new church home where we can grow and build a legacy and live for a long time and expand and really make it our own, see what this church is capable of. I said I wanted a church that's as beautiful on the outside as it is on the inside. We are beautiful on the inside. On the outside, we're excited about the new building. So the, <laughs> so the other thing that I knew for sure is that we are going to press into the fivefold. Not just talk about it, not just on a message, but that this is going to become a foundational component of who we are as a church, as Family Life Christian Center. And here's what I love about it, is that the fivefold ministry is God's design for the church. That's how he designed it to work. Uh, and what I love about our church vision is it doesn't remove what we're doing here, but the goal is to help you fulfill your highest calling in Christ. Everything in our church vision is our unique expression of how uh, we present Jesus or how Jesus operates through our unique body of believers and what we provide and our unique giftings to the people that walk in this door. The fivefold ministry is the foundation of all church. So it was really neat. I've been reading through this book, 5Q, uh, and I'll explain why it's called that in a bit, by Alan Hirsch. Uh, it's really deep. It's a big, deep intellectual theological dive into uh, why we can kind of rely on the fivefold, why we believe it. And he takes significant time in the beginning of the book saying that according to uh, theology, it's grounded in God himself. According to cos And these are just different ways of thinking or ways of studying the Bible. According to cosmology, it's laced, laced by God throughout his creation. According to Christology, it's incorporated fully by Jesus into his perfect life. According to ecclesiology, it's made real in and through the life of God's people. According to pneumatology, it's activated through the work of the Spirit. And according to missiology and eschatology, it's fulfilled in God's eternal purposes through the ecclesia. He's like, any way you slice it, it's true. It's necessary. There's no way to get around it. And what I love is he said that, and he, he had spent his life work basically studying these powerful missional movements where like the world was rocked and changed and hundreds of thousands of new believers came into the kingdom. People were activated in their gifts and missionaries were sent out in, these lifelong, in his lifelong study of world-shaping religious movements. He says, and I quote, there has never been a Jesus movement with long-term societal impact that did not have the fivefold fully operative in its organization and among its members. The fivefold is demonstrably evident in movements that change the world. So I don't know about you guys, I would love family life to change the world. I would love our church to be the epicenter of revival in our state, in our world. Do you guys want that? Yeah, okay, I want our church and those around us to experience the fullness of Christ. Everything that he was and is, I want them to experience that here at this church. Do you guys want that? Yeah, and I want you personally and us corporately to fulfill our highest calling in Christ. Do you guys want that? Cool, then let's get started. So we're gonna, this may start to sound a little bit like uh, repeat. I talked about this last October. I'm sure you all remember every word that was spoken, but I'm gonna say it again because this is going to become foundational. And if anyone in our church ever says, hey, what's up with the fivefold? They can come back to this message and learn what's the foundation? Where does it come from? What is it? How does it work? So let's begin. And our, our core foundational text for this is coming out of Ephesians 4, verses 7 through 16. And I'm going to read this out of the Passion. And some people would say, well, the Passion's not like the real Bible. That's like the pretty Bible. It's like, hang on. There's actually a lot of additional context in there. The language adds clarity. All of this lines up in an NIV, an ESV, whatever you want to read it in. But the language of the Passion, I think, makes it a little bit easier to communicate. So you can study it in any, any translation you want. Today, we're reading it out of the Passion. So verse 7, and he has generously given each one of us supernatural grace according to the size of the gift of Christ. So who, and he has given uh, generously, each one of us, who is he? God has, Jesus has, according to the size of the gift of Christ. What's fun about this is when he says given, he has generously given, the word given back to the Greek root of it is what's called an aorist indicative. What is that? 
I didn't really know. So what it means is that in the Greek language, when an aorist indicative is used, which is a kind of word, it means like it's done, permanent, forever, constitutional. Like it happened in the past, it was wildly important, and it still shapes the present, and it happened, and it's never going to be removed, always and forever, given. So I think the argument here, too, that people like to make of, well, you know, apostles and uh, uh, prophets, they're not for today. Like, hold on a second. The aorist indicative, through the language used, clearly indicates these were not gifts that were taken back. They were given. Hands off. No takesies, backsies. Not happening. So that's also further exemplified. But I just want to say, too, there's something so just the, the kind of aorist indicative used here is not used that often throughout Scripture. So what the language of this demonstrates for us is that this is important. This is foundational. This is crucial. Let's move on. Verse 8. This is why he says, he ascends into the heavenly heights, talking about Jesus, taking his many captured ones with him. Other ones say he took captivity captive. The idea that you could take somebody captive, Jesus took that captive. Hilarious. Uh, And gifts were given to men and women. He ascended, which means that he returned to heaven after he had first descended from the heights of heaven, even descending as far as the lowest parts of the earth. The same one who descended is also the one who ascended above the heights of heaven in order to begin the restoration and fulfillment of all things. This is kind of interesting too, because unbeknownst to me, maybe God was preparing us for this. This is kind of like that hero's journey we talked about. This is kind of like that transformation through suffering. The idea that in any good movie, in any good story, you have a hero, somebody who crosses past a threshold from the known into the unknown. As soon as they cross the unknown, now they're on an adventure. And they usually get beaten and bruised and suffered. They have mentors and guides that help them along the way until they reach the lowest possible point of suffering. Everything is falling apart. I am completely destroyed. I am crushed. There is nothing left of me. But then our hero finds some new resolve and starts bringing it back around. They learn something. They gain some new strength or power or wisdom that they didn't have before that allows them to conquer the thing that previously conquered them and bring it all the way back around to the top of that cycle, this hero's journey, where now that you're back at the top, you've gained this new gift that now you get to give to the people, to the community. And Moana, when she goes on her adventure, by the end of it, she has restored the heart of Tefiti. Everyone has whole coconuts again. Like, you know, the idea is that I had to go through a difficult adventure to get something new that I can bring back with me that would bless the people. Even in The Lion King, Simba goes off on his journey, gets this low, low point of suffering, loses entire faith in himself, but he discovers his identity. He discovers responsibility. He becomes a king, and then he conquers the thing that previously conquered him, and now the land has a ruler again. The people are blessed. So when a hero descends into the unknown, endures suffering, gains something new, and returns to the people with a new gift, he's saying that's what Jesus did. I just kind of blew past this the first time I read it. I'm like, okay, Jesus came and rose and then we got stuff. It's like, that's cool. But what he's saying here is Jesus is actually the first true hero. He is the hero. That hero's journey, no one has ever gone lower or returned higher or gained more gifts and goods to give to the world than Jesus Christ. He's the number one hero. Every hero story in the world is just trying to be as good as Jesus. That's all it is. So what he's saying is that Christ is our hero. He is the singular archetypal hero. And he said when he, when he was down there and when he was going through the mud, everything he did, he came back so that he could give these gifts. And this is what I think is fun too, is because there's the gifts of the spirit that is given to the gifts. You could say God gives gifts as well. The earth itself is a gift and dominion over it and authority and responsibility. But what he says is that these are gifts specifically given by Jesus. And I think what's fun about that is that the gifts themselves are not so much you have the gift of, uh, you know, there is a prophet, but it's not so much about prophecy or helps or giving. This is about people. An apostle is a person, and a, sh- and a teacher is a person, and an evangelist is a person. And what's cool is that the, the Holy Spirit is not visible, and God is not visible. Jesus was visible, human, present on the earth. So the kind of gifts that Jesus gave are the ones that are going to bless us when we are present, visible, and operating here on the earth. The fivefold gifts were the ones that Jesus modeled as our hero, as our divine archetype, as the singular best possible apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, pastor. He was the best one, and he demonstrated that, 
And as he lived and endured and came back with the fulfillment of all of those things and gave them to us, that's why these gifts came from Christ. So specifically from Jesus. So I think that's beautiful. So now let's uh, talk about a couple other things here. We'll skip that. Oh, this is just kind of a fun thing, but uh, something else mentioned in 5Q. He says that uh, worship defined can be described or can be defined as offering the world back to God. So what happened is we've always had, you know, we, even if we never had apostles, we always had like entrepreneurs and builders, you know, before Jesus. And even though we never, you know, we had some prophets, but there was also like sages and spiritualists. And, you know, even if we didn't have evangelists, there's always salespeople. Like there was kind of this like woven into the fabric of creation were these fivefold gifts, but they were not fulfilled and restored until Jesus. So when Jesus comes back and he gives the fivefold to, to mankind, uh, he also gives it back to God. He's basically saying, hey, these things that were in the world, I restored them, and now I'm offering them back to you, God, as an act of worship. So I thought, isn't that cool that the fivefold expression is actually the way that Jesus offers worship to God? That's very interesting. Let's move on. Verse 11. So now, what are these gifts? What are these things that Jesus has given us? He has appointed some with grace to be apostles, and this is out of the passion. Normally, it would just say apostle, prophet, but this is talking about grace. You have a grace to it. You're good at it, and you don't know why. It just happens naturally. It's already in you. You have a supernatural grace that allows you to do things that other people can't. Why? Just because you have a grace. It's a gift of grace that's been given to you. He appointed some with the grace to be apostles, some with the grace to be prophets, some with grace to be evangelists, some with grace to be pastors, and some with grace to be teachers. What I love is everyone can be a teacher, but some people have a supernatural grace to teach. It's just easier for them. They can't explain why, but it just is. They have a grace about it. Of course, everyone can teach, but some just have a grace to teach. Uh, so I want to do something real quick before we move on. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. The way that uh, 5Q defines it is they'll, the shorthand for the 5Q is a pest. And you say, well, where did the S come from? So the way that it's defined here by Alan Hirsch is he says, rather than the word pastor, he uses the word shepherd. And you go, okay, why use the word shepherd? He doesn't actually describe it in clear vision, but I love that he did because maybe he understood the same thing that I did, is the word pastor is kind of just a catch-all for anything and anyone that does ministry. Like if you're a leader in a church, you're a pastor. It's like, but, but I'm really, I'm an evangelist. It's like, no, but pastor, you're, a, you're an evangelist pastor. You're the pastor of evangelism. It's like, no, I'm just an evangelist, you know, like, and I, yeah, I teach, but I'm not like a pastor. It's like, no, but you're a church leader, so you, you're just a pastor. Like, pastor just covers everything. And even when I came into this position, everyone's like, Pastor Danny, that's your name. There's a reason why I went with senior leader is because a leader is more of an apostolic function. I went through these tests. I took all the things, and I've been studying this like crazy. And what I've learned about myself is that my apostolic grace is my highest gift. Teaching is a close second. Everything else is like almost tied for third place. So apostolic and teaching grace is, the, is what I am bringing as the leader of family life. You can call me pastor, but really what I'm providing is apostle and teacher. So you can call me pastor, but you might not get pastor from me. You're going to get apostle from me. Sometimes people will come saying, Danny, I just want you to like comfort me. And I'm like, I'm actually going to call you into your destiny. And they're like, well, that's not very comfortable. I'm like, well, I'm not very pastoral. So, <laughs> so I just want to say here, as we talk about this, when I say, when we say shepherd, <laughs> yeah, when we say shepherd, shepherd is the person who takes care of the flock. They are, they are a person who wants to keep things safe wants to keep people connected, that's a shepherd. Now, pastor too, is someone someone leading a church executively into its future, that's just an executive pastor. No, that's more of an apostle. So just to help distinguish between the two, pastor and shepherd, we're going to use the word shepherd because it's going to help us di differentiate between pastor as the world has come to know it as just every kind of church leader, and we're going to put it back into its place uh, because we need to understand what a pastor is and what a pastor isn't. Okay? Good. So uh, I'm going to do it the fun way when we, when we talk about these five. We'll go through these quickly, because what we're going to do too is we're going to dig into each one of these things, like the deep dive, 
coming up soon. But just so that we're all back on the same page, we understand what we're talking about, I want to go through these things, and we'll do the fun way. Everyone give me, a, uh, give me your pinky finger. Show me that real quick. Very nice. Everybody has one. That's cool. Nice. Um, so the pinky is meant to represent the teacher. So fivefold, right, if you need help remembering them. The teacher. Now, the teacher is somebody who, you can put your pinkies down. If you, <laughs> Natalie, that was really for you. <laughs> You're doing great. A little teacher's bed over here. Um, so anyways, the teacher is someone who can explain and clarify the truth. The Bible's a big old book. There's some complicated concepts in there. You look at that and you go, I don't even know what this means. Even looking at that whole, the idea that Christ descended and ascended and gave gifts, I've completely missed that until somebody with a teaching gift broke it down for me, communicated it in a way that I couldn't understand, and now I have new understanding and revelation and a better grasp on who God is and what his word says. So teacher is someone who can be, they help to bring clarity and turn implicit things into explicit things. What I mean by that is like, I just feel like I see this thing and it, it, I'm sensing like a pattern and I feel like God's saying this. And then a teacher can say, okay, let's see those components. Let's root that in the word of God. Let's find a way to communicate it so that A can reach B and C. And okay, this is exactly what you're talking about. So they can kind of put words to things that other people can't and communicate things that would otherwise be confusing. That's a teacher. So then next finger, the ring finger. That's actually a really hard one just these two is kind of weird to hold them up. So the ring finger is our shepherd, our pastor, right? Our pastoral gift. So our shepherd, why the ring finger? Well, that's, that's covenant. That's marriage. That's relationship. United, one with somebody else in a marriage, the ring finger. I should use this one. That's that, that community, that unitedness. Uh, so the shepherd, again, they guard, they love, they feed, they encourage, they protect, they take care of the flock. They are connectors and community builders. What I love most about shepherds is they allow us to live like family. Because if we didn't have shepherds around helping us come back together, helping smooth over the tension, helping to minister to people who are suffering, when everyone feels cared for and empowered, and when a shepherd is there to kind of smooth over the tension of certain things, people can live like family again. It makes it easy to connect. And, and if anyone ever starts wandering off, they can gently just kind of scoop them all back in. Everyone's nice and safe and comfortable. And that's also the problem, too, when we say pastors are just any kind of church leader. It's like, well, if the only thing a church is doing is keeping everybody cozy and safe and warm in this hen's wings little pillow situation, it's like, well, how is the church going to really reach its highest calling? How are we going to challenge these people? How are we going to get outside of the wings if the shepherd's just trying to keep everyone in and safe? So at some point, someone's got to say, no, empower you, get out there, go. The lost are outside of the wings. You know, we need everybody here. So the shepherds are great. Pastors are great, but they're not the only thing. That's not the only expression of Jesus as the body of Christ. So that's the shepherd. Then we get to the evangelist. Uh, so that's the longest finger, the middle finger. I was driving home from Florida. Somebody was calling me an evangelist uh, <laughs> as I was passing by them. I said, thanks, I'm more a papistolic, but thank you. Uh, so I gave him a thumbs up, because that was me. So anyways, the <laughs> so <laughs> middle finger is the evangelist. Uh, why? Because it reaches the farthest. If I'm reaching out to somebody, the other things don't quite reach as far out as an evangelist will. Evangelist concern, their primary concern is with the people outside of the church, if you're with an evangelist, they love you. They're happy to see you. I love coming to church, but really, there's people out there that we have to talk to. I heard Danny Silk said, he's like, if we're up to the evangelist, there'd be no chairs in the church. He's like, they might not even meet, being like, no, what are you doing here? Get out of there. So evangelists are the one, too, that they, well, this is, was fun, too. Um, in the book, it said that Christ is the evangel. I'm like, evangel? Like, I know what evangelism is a word, but what's an evangel or an evangel? I don't even know how to pronounce it, but evangel defined just means gospel, which is the good news. So what I love is when you say that someone is an evangelist, they're just a gospelist. They're just a, they're just a good newsist. There's somebody that just, they cannot stop proclaiming the good news of God, the, the goodness of who he is, inviting people in the family. Guys, salvation's available to you today. You could be in this family. You could understand who you are. You can have eternal life. You can have the wisdom and the universe. Your life can be fruitful and abundant. God's given you a gift. They just cannot stop telling people the good news, specifically people who don't know it yet. So that's our evangelist. The prophet uh, is going to be our pointer finger, 
Because a lot of times, prophet can kind of point things out. They not only point people in a certain direction, but they can also point to something in your heart that needs attention. The prophet, they're the body of Christ. They're the eyes and the ears. So they are, they see and hear what God has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. They specialize in staying connected intimately with God in the present moment. I love that. So the way that Chris Valentin explains it out of Bethel is that the prophet's the one who connects the phone line from heaven and then hands you the the, you know, the, the receiver, right? So I'm going to connect the line from heaven to you so that you can hear what's going on up there. Like he's saying something to me and I'm saying it to you. Like, did you know that that's what they're saying? Like I, there's someone who's listening to God and speaking what they are hearing. And that involves a present moment connectedness to being able to hear from God. What are you saying? What are you saying about this person? What are you saying about our church? What are you saying about the future right now? What are you saying in this dream? Like, what does it mean? So prophets usually have a way to just intimately stay one, connected with Christ, and they have an ability to then draw out the absolute best inside of a person. Uh, I will say this too before I move on. In 5Q, the only thing, again, it's the kind of thing where anytime you read anything or hear a message from anyone, there's things you're going to agree with, there's things that are going to challenge you, and there's going to be things that just flat out you disagree with. I don't know exactly where I'm at yet, but the only thing right now in reading this book is I would just say, if you are reading it, which by the way, 5Q by Alan Hirsch, we have it at our resource wall. It's meaty, but it's good. The way that prophecy is described in this book, I'm not 100% on board with it. I shouldn't say not on board with it, but what I will say is it sounds like as he describes prophecy, it's more about... Um, reinforcing the covenant, the new covenant that we have with Christ about sort of like being the, uh, almost like the, the covenant keepers in the way that they'll be the ones to kind of let the body know when they are out of line or when they've missed something from God. And that's still useful and good, but I feel like the supernatural component isn't quite captured in this book. And I know that when Bethel talks about it and there's other you know, sources that I've been listening to that talk about it, and they say, no, a prophet is a supernatural powerhouse. They, are connect- they hear directly from God. They can move in signs and wonders. They can hear him speak and they can share that on his behalf. This book doesn't cover much of that aspect of the prophetic. So all I'm going to say is that it doesn't mean throw the book out. It just means read that with a grain of salt. And I think there's still a lot to be gained from that interpretation, even if it's not the primary one we use to define the prophet. So that's all I'm going to say about that. And then the last one is the apostle. Now, here's the fun one. Give me your hands. Hands up for a second. So the apostle is the, only, is the one that can touch all of the other ones. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. Now, why is that the case? Well, the apostle, their gift is to build structures and communities and kingdoms, like we're saying with this new building, the living room. It's a new model, a new structure, a system of expressing God's goodness here on the earth. Now, an apostle can't do that by themselves. They're going to need teachers and evangelists and shepherds and the other one, prophets. So I, I always forget one, right? It's like the love languages. I'm like, wait, there's the fifth one? So I just make one up then. Um, so, the, uh, so anyways, the apostle then is going to be the one that usually brings all of the gifts and they kind of like, they have the plan. They have the blueprint from heaven. What does this kingdom look like? Uh, the apostle literally translated means, translated means sent one. So an apostle is one who has got a mission from God who says, go here, do this, build that with these people for these people. So there's something very specific about that. And I didn't really understand that I had any apostolic gifting or grace until God said, hey, Danny, with, with Family Life Christian Center, build this kind of church in this kind of location with these kind of people to have this kind of impact on the world. And I went, whoa, like, that sounds like a very specific mission that involves building something new and utilizing all of the other giftedness of the people in our church. And then I was suddenly learning, oh, that's apostolic grace. That's what that is. So it's kind of entrepreneurial. It's very big picture. It's building. A lot of times they're kingdom builders, governing authorities, entrepreneurs. They position people and unify them towards a unique mission. So here's what I love about this. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. These five things Jumping outside of Ephesians 4 for a bit, in 1 Peter 4.10, and this is also out of the Passion, it says, every believer has received grace gifts, which we've also just talked about, so use them to serve one another as faithful stewards of the many-colored tapestry of God's grace. Isn't that a beautiful picture there? Like, 
What is God's grace? It is a tapestry, a multicolored tapestry. There's many. So when we say, yeah, God gives us grace. It's like, okay, well, grace comes in a couple different flavors. It comes in a couple different colors and shades and styles. It has different sounds to it. It's not just, it is, there's just grace, but then there's also specific kinds and colors and types and shadows and shapes of grace. And it's saying that as faithful, sorry, so use your gifts of grace. Maybe all I have is blue and purple. Maybe all I have is green and white. Whatever you got, use those, those grace gifts to serve one another as faithful stewards of the many colored tapestry of God's grace. Now, here's where it gets fun, because the church functioning in the fivefold is when we say we're not just a church that has one color, not even two colors or three colors. We weave them all together, tightly knit into this beautifully interconnected woven body where I might not have everything you need. I might only have one piece. But when you experience a community of believers that are united using your gifts and tying and weaving each other together, we become this many colored tapestry of God's grace. You begin to see the big picture. You go, wow, I just thought God was an evangelist. You know, I just thought Jesus was like a prophet or something like that. And you go, no, 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 no. This is who he is. Look at this beautiful, big picture interwoven, all these graces. That is Jesus. That is the fullness of Christ. That's what we're after. So let's move back to Ephesians 4, verse 12 now. And they're calling, and this is ending with... uh, He's given grace, these gifts to all of these five people. So their calling, the calling of the church, the calling of each of these five uh, archetypes is to nurture and prepare all the holy believers to do their own works of ministry. And as they do this, they will enlarge and build up the body of Christ. Here's something fun there. When it says that they're going to prepare all the holy believers, what they're talking about is in NIV, it says to equip the saints. We are the saints. Everyone say, I'm a saint. I'm a saint. Okay, let's settle down a little bit there. You're, uh, so guys, wow, just so full of yourselves. Yeah, you're per- anyway, so you are, though. You are a saint, right? And all sin has been removed, you know, washed white as snow. You have been restored to a holy people. You are filled with a holy spirit. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You, have been, you are saints now. You are spotless lambs like God. He has restored you. And we constantly need to remain in relationship with him because we constantly need to be forgiven and saved and brought back into that perfect, that perfect wholeness, that sainthood, that holiness. So as saints, to equip the saints, the word equip, going back to the Greek here, because I love the Greek, is katartizo. I don't think that's how they say it. That was more Italian. But... <laughs> Catartizo uh, can be defined as a couple different ways that that word can be used. It can be defined as to mend what has been broken or torn apart. That's interesting. Like a torn tapestry. Like we took one of the colors out of it. We removed the piece of the puzzle. And what he's saying to equip the saints is actually to mend it all back together. That's beautiful. A couple other definitions is say to perfectly join together, to perfect or to complete And this is my favorite one, equipping the saints. You, equipping there, catartizo, can be defined as to make one what one ought to be. So to equip the saints, when the fivefold interacts with you, as you interact with these gifts, what these gifts do, as everyone else is sharing their gifts with you, they're actually making you into what you ought to be. One might say, fulfilling your highest calling in Christ. That's what you ought to be. What you ought to be was God's design for you. The fullness of who you are, you're in the fivefold context and community, you will actually learn and be equipped to become what you ought to be, the way that God has designed you. That is beautiful to me. So when it says equip the holy believers, that's not just put a couple tools in your belt. That is to restore you into the fullness of who God created you to be. That is beautiful language there. So the way that he says in the book, and I love this, he says, in a very real sense, and I quote, we not only need each other in order to be ourselves, but we really need each other at a whole new level if we are to be the body of Christ. So what he says is, we need each other in order to be ourselves. I need all of you in order to learn how to be me. Because somehow there's something in each of you that that I need to become myself, but I don't have it yet. And the only way I can get it is if you equip me. If you share your gifts 
to bring out the gift that's inside of me. It says you cannot learn to be yourself by yourself is what that means. And I'm going to say that again. For people that say, oh, I don't need to go to church on Sunday. Well, the church is boring. Well, I don't want to connect with anybody. I'd rather sleep in. And you know, I could just listen to podcasts and I can just do things like that. You're missing something because you cannot learn how to be yourself by yourself. You need the community of believers who have unique gifts that you don't have yet, but you will get them when you are in that community. You cannot learn the fullness of yourself without everybody else. So I want to tell a story real quick here. When I was a kid, I was what they call a late bloomer. I was a very, very shy, quiet, passive kid. I know looking at me now, it's nothing has changed. I used to sit, I used to go to big social gatherings and for a, a shy, quiet, introverted kid, maybe one of the worst things that could have happened to me was I got a Game Boy which is video games that you can keep in your pocket. So then I would go to these big parties and social events and classes and theater events, and mom would always like tote me along to these things and say, Danny, look at all these beautiful people. You can interact with them. You can make friends. They can teach you who you're going to be. You can form lifelong bonds that are going to shape you and mold you. And I go, I'm good. And I would sit in the corner, literally in the corner of a room bigger than this, pop out my Game Boy and just sit there. And if someone tried to talk to me, I'd be like, hey, I'm kind of busy right now. And I would just get back to my Game Boy. My brother, my younger brother would always ask, hey, Danny, all the neighborhood kids outside, they're playing like a pickup game of baseball. We're going to like, you know, put recycling bins on top of skateboards and race them down the street. You know, we're going to play cops and robbers. You know, we got water guns. You want to come do that? I'm like, nah, I'm good. And I would sit in the corner by myself. (laughs) This is probably why I was a late bloomer. No one was ever teaching me how to be myself. I was a blank slate. I had nothing. I I was just so disconnected from everybody. I didn't know how to participate in the world. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I cared about. I didn't know what gifts I had because I was never around people. So what I thought was fun about this then is mom, quite quite against my will, uh, signed me up for theater. And what do you do with a shy introvert kid? You put him on stage with a thousand people in bright lights. Of course. So, but all of a sudden I realized, oh, dang, like this is very new and very scary. And I'm going to have to learn how to thrive in this environment. I don't want to look like an idiot on stage, but you're pretty good at being on stage. Can you tell me how do you, how do you do that? Like, how do you get on stage and look amazing? And I get on stage and I look like a potato rolled off from the wings. Like what, how do you do that? And that person then got to inform me, you know, this is what it looks like to have confidence. This is what it looks like to use your, to extend your arms and detach your elbows from your hips. I remember someone literally having to say, I would stand up there and my elbows would be glued to my sides the whole time. Someone had to say, Danny, detach the elbows. Like, <laughs> extend your arms fully. And I was like, oh, I, did. I never knew that. No one told me. I never tried before. And it wasn't until I was around people that I got that instruction. And then when I went to school, I was around a lot of da- doctors and medical people. And that was an interesting one because I, I studied medicine for four years And then in my fourth year, my senior year of my undergrad in biomedical science, ready to be a doctor, I finally said, you know what, I should volunteer at a hospital just so I can get familiar with the environment. I got into a hospital. I learned some things from some people. But more importantly, I learned that, oh, this isn't me. Like, I've been studying this. I love the pursuit. I love the science of it all. But as soon as I got in the environment, I realized, oh, this is not my gift. Like, this, this is not what God has made me to be. I learned something, even in the negative, even when I got it wrong, by being around other people I learned what I wasn't, not just what I was. And then that instructed me. Like, if only I had volunteered at a hospital my freshman year, I would have changed majors before the end of the first year. I would have figured out this is not my, but I was never around the people that were going to inform that in me. I got around a videographer who asked me, hey, can you act in a video shoot that I'm doing? And at that video shoot, I was just fascinated by the whole process of like, how do you do this? And what's your lifestyle look like? How does this equipment work? And how do you make something creative and fun? And that brought something alive in me that I didn't even know was in there. I, now I'm a videographer, full-time professional, and I never would have guessed. I never once in my life thought, I'm going to be a videographer. But until I got around people that had that gift, that grace, they actually instructed me on who I was. I didn't know how to be myself by myself. As I was in a community with other people, their giftings not only poured into me, but resonated with what was already inside of me. And even when I started coming around the Barlows in this community, I felt like I was an entirely different person But what someone had told me was that it's not that you are changing into something you weren't, it's that you're finally becoming who you already were. That's what was happening. 
So the body of Christ, this, this group of believers, us right here as a church, as a family, interconnected, woven, honoring each other, benefiting from each other, staying close to each other, that is how we learn how to fulfill our highest calling in Christ. That's how you're going to learn who you are. And that's how you are going to help you are a desperate component of somebody else learning who they are. We need you as much as you need us. We need each other. That is what a body of believers looks like. So what I love about this too is that of the fullness of Christ, it's broken up into the body of believers. I think that's really cool because no one of us can do this by ourselves. No one of us can individually represent the 100% fullness of Christ. We can be equipped in all five and we can be pretty effective in all five, but to flow freely in it as a master with that supernatural grace, as an individual, we can't do it. As a body, absolutely. That's how we do it. So what I love about that is that we're, we're learning and we're teaching each other at all times. So in a true five-fold community, you have to learn how to be both a giver and a receiver. You have to be a master and a novice. You have to be a leader and a follower. I have things you don't have, but you have things I don't have. We need to, we need to connect and we need to stay close to each other so we can both receive what the other one needs. So that's beautiful. So even the idea, too, of these five kind of things that each have their own grace, their own level of intellect. Uh, the way that Alan Hirsch describes it is that you have like an intelligence quotient, your IQ, right? And this is where 5Q comes from. You have your intelligence quotient, your IQ. Then there was your uh, EQ is now a thing, your emotional quotient. How good are you at understanding the emotions of other people? But what he's saying is that there's also then like an apostolic quotient, there's an apostolic intelligence, a way of thinking, things that an apostolically graced person just thinks and does. That it's just not how the other four think. And then the prophet, they're going to think and operate and understand things that the other ones don't. So there's a prophetic intelligence that is unique to the prophet. So he says is there's like an apostolic quotient, apostolic intelligence, AQ, and then there's PQ and EQ and SQ and TQ, five of those, and you've got 5Q, baby. That's where it comes from. I just had to get you there yourselves. You did it. I'm so proud of you. So, <laughs> so what he says, too, that I love about this is that these gifts are synergistic. Does anyone know synergy? Anyone in the corporate world, you know what I'm talking about. So synergy is one plus one equals three. And then one plus one plus one equals five. You know, and on and on. It's basically, you get a better result. And the famous example of this is the Belgian draft horse, which is a horse designed to pull a heavy weight. If you put one horse pulling as much weight as it can possibly pull, one Belgian draft horse can pull about 8,000 pounds, which I did the math, that's 43 dannies. So 43 dannies laying down on a sled, the draft horse can pull 43 dannies. Don't do the math, I'll be embarrassed. Uh, so then two Belgian draft horse, you put them next to each other, and two Belgian draft horses pull. Now, if 8,000 pounds is what one can pull, how many should two be able to pull? 16,000, double what the other one could. But that's not what happens. What happens is two horses can pull 22,000 pounds. That's a lot more than 16. That's actually about 2.75 times the amount. So how is it that one plus one, so one equals eight, you know, one plus one equals two. But in this case, what they're saying is one plus one equals 2.75. Something has happened, synergy. And what they say is that when you train these two horses to pull together, when they've spent time next to each other, learning how the other one operates, learning about its strength and how it moves and when it pushes and when it pulls, then two trained Belgian draft horses can pull 32,000 pounds. I don't know if you're doing the math there. That's four times the amount that one can pull. How does that happen? They can pull, they can pull double the amount of weight individually when they are trained doing it next to each other. So that's the idea of synergy. When we talk about the church, we can be a church where we're just apostles, and what are we going to get? We're going to get one color of grace. But then if we're apostles and prophets, we don't only have two colors of grace, somehow we find a third. And then when we have apostle, prophet, evangelist, suddenly it's not just a third, suddenly we have about five or six coming. Like, hold on, there's more than what we individually have, and when they all work together, that's how we get to the fullness of Christ. Every color. All of them combining, weaving together. We don't just have red and we don't have yellow. Now we have orange. Why? Because you're weaving near each other. We have things that couldn't exist unless both of us were pulling together, trained and connected. So 
let's keep moving because I want to get through the rest of this Ephesians 4. So in verse 13, uh, Ephesians 4, 13, three, these grace ministries will function until we attain oneness in the faith, until we all experience the fullness of what it means to know the Son of God, and we finally become one into a perfect man with the full dimensions of just kidding. It cuts off on the screen. Until we become one, one perfect man with the fullness and with the full dimensions of spiritual maturity and fully developed into the abundance of Christ. So this is beautiful too, because what we're saying is that these will function, like we said, uh, what do we say before? That aortic indicative, now and forever. They will function forever until we achieve oneness into the faith. Are we all as a global church, one body? Or do we have a few people that disagree? Do we have a few people that don't look exactly like Jesus? I think we got a couple stragglers. We're still trying to catch them up. So until every single person reflects the fullness and experiences the fullness of who Christ is, we got work to do. So that means we have, we need all these things. And that means that the people who say the apostolic and prophetic thing has died off, I don't think that's true. There's no scripture that says that they're limited. There's no history that says we achieved it because we haven't. And so anyways, I'm, oh, I could go into that one. So what I love about this is oneness into the faith. So it talks about that. They will function until we attain oneness in the faith. What I love about that, the thing I thought about with oneness was like a marriage. And the phrase that came to mind was, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So God joined these fivefold gifts together. And a lot of times when we don't know how to work together, when we don't understand honor, there's a reason Danny Silk's book on the fivefold is called Culture of Honor. When we don't know how to live like family, we don't know how to respect our differences, we don't know how to communicate, to give, and to receive, when we don't know those things, man kind of tends to separate those gifts. We say, oh, the evangelists, they're a bunch of flighty weirdos that have no interest in the church. Yeah, we don't need any of them. Well, hang on a second. Now we have APST. That's not the fivefold. That's the fourfold. And the fourfold gets a diminished product. And then we say, well, the prophets, you know, like, I don't believe anyone can hear from God, so we just, we don't do prophecy around here. We don't do prophets. Okay, now we have AST. We're missing a couple things. Now, maybe if the fivefold has a 25 result, cutting out one doesn't just bring it down to 20. Maybe that brings it down to like 16. We cut out another one. The threefold maybe can only do like the ninefold. And then maybe the twofold can only do like the four. Like, it gets reduced down to a church that is missing out on the fullness of Christ. So how can a church, how can Christians designed to imitate Christ be Christ when entire components of who he is are not present in our church? Anything we do, any expression of the church is lacking the grace and gift and person of Jesus. So if we want to know who exactly Jesus was, we're not going to find him unless we have all of the fivefold gifts operating in our church. So then the fullness of Christ too, he is the head of the church and we are his body. Uh, so, yeah, so his example is the model for the church. His word sustains the church. His mission and purposes are at the heart of the church. And the fully actualized fivefold is every piece of Christ reconstituted and reborn in this world. What I love about that is that Jesus Christ was the word made flesh. Then the word made flesh of Jesus, if we were to be imitators of Christ, we are to be imitators of the word. So who Jesus is, as we imitate him, and align ourselves with the word, we are actually becoming Jesus reborn in the flesh within us. That's how we are the body of Christ. He is the head, but we're the boots on the ground. We're the people in the earth that are actually doing the touching. We're the tangible expressions of Christ on the earth. And then, oh, this is, this is a good one. This is one of my favorite parts of the whole message. You guys ready for this? So John 14, 12 through 14, NIV. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do, will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Pause there. Here he's talking to his disciples. He's talking to a gathered body of believers who are all currently focused on imitating Christ, becoming his disciples. One might say that's like an ecclesia, right? Ecclesia being the original word for church. An ecclesia just means a group of believers dedicated to following and imitating Christ. So what he's saying is he's saying to his ecclesia, his church, his group, his people, his, his, his multiple disciples, all of them, talking to all of them, he's saying, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will, they will do even greater things than these. 
When they say they will do even greater things, is he talking to an individual or is he talking to the ecclesia? Is he talking to the group? They, all of you, will do the works, or sorry, the works I've been doing and you'll do even greater things because I'm going to the Father. Let's go on. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I will do whatever you ask. Is that you or is that you all? Is that you individual or is that you ecclesia or ecclesia? I can never, I always mix that one up. But is that you church? Am I asking you individual or am I asking you group? And now let's go on to verse 14. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. So this idea that we always talk about, you know, we're trying to be imitators of Christ, which means we have to do the same things as him. And that also means that he's saying when we're doing our job right, we'll actually do greater things than he ever did. But my question is, is he talking to individuals or is he talking to the group? Is he talking to the ecclesia? Is he talking to the church? So what I think about is, can I, you know, does that mean that I have to do signs and wonders and I have to be the best teacher in the world and I have to be a pastoral person who can bring in the lost sheep and I have to be an evangelist and I have to be the apostle that's sending out and and building things on earth? Is it that you have to be all of them or is it that we all have to be all of them? Is that a shared responsibility? When he says greater things will you do, is he saying greater things will Cody do? Greater things will Joel do? Or is he saying greater things will you all in the room will do? Greater things will you all Christians will do together as you exemplify the fullness of who I am? I think that's very cool. So then let's finish this out. Verse 14, Ephesians 4. And this is kind of just like stick the landing, get, it, get hyped about this, because he talks about this is where it came from, this is what it is and how it works, and now in Ephesians 14, he's, he's telling us this is what it looks like when you do it. When you succeed, this is what happens. Verse 14, then our immaturity will end, praise the Lord. Yeah. Now here's, a, <laughs> and I love that so much. And every time I see maturity, specifically spiritual maturity, what I think of is A a child, we have three of them, in the beginning, they need milk. They need constant supervision. They need attention. They don't know anything. They can't take care of themselves. And if you stop taking care of them, then they're never going to make it. If if we're talking spiritual maturity, if you don't feed and nurture and nurse somebody who's, who's a spiritual baby, and you suddenly remove that from them, then they will become spiritually dead. The same way that a baby will not survive if you're not constantly feeding it and caring for them. So spiritual maturity is when we say, I need to be fed because this is all brand new to me. But then saying, okay, well, now I'm going to become a toddler. I know a couple of things, and I can get snacks out of the pantry by myself. You know, I can start to feed myself a little bit. There's a couple of things I know, and then I know the name of Jesus, and I know that he loves me. That's a start. I know a few things the way that a toddler knows a few things. And then all of a sudden you become a teenager. And now I think I know everything. So now, we, so now we have teenage spiritual people saying, oh, I have all the answers to everything. And then the spiritual grandmas and grandpas are going, oh, this is hilarious. So, and then we have to mature beyond that where we say, okay, you don't actually have all the answers. And it's actually not that simple all the time. Maybe there's complexities and richness that you're missing out on. Then we become spiritual adults. And then we start looking for, for union with other people. We look for strong bonds. And then if we're doing that correctly, we actually spiritually reproduce. We're actually, we have enough inside of us, enough maturity to raise up other believers. So now it's not just that I'm capable of feeding myself and paying my bills and taking care of my own housing and responsibilities. I can actually help you begin to carry your own. I can actually spiritually reproduce and create more and more children, which who become teenagers, who become adults, who become mothers and fathers, who become grandmothers and grandfathers as we are growing together. So what I love about our immaturity will end. We're not going to stay babies. Praise the Lord. We're going to actually learn things. We're going to learn how to feed ourselves. We're going to learn how to feed others. And who you are, when you achieve your fullness, you're actually going to influence other people where they are going to achieve their highest calling in Christ because you have reached maturity. And you reach maturity because you had mothers and fathers and spiritual grandmothers and grandfathers who poured into you, who allowed you to become who you were supposed to be. Immaturity will end, meaning we're actually going to initiate this cycle of we're growing ourselves up. We're constantly raising up the next generation, raising up new believers until they are powerful, effective ministers of the kingdom of God. Let's move on. And that's just the first one, guys. That's the first one. 
And then we will not be easily shaken by trouble or led astray. That's great too, which means that if something comes along, the world looks a little scary. Someone says, hey, I have a new ideology. And we go, hold up, what does that do? Yours has been around for three weeks. This has been around for 2,000 years. Like, tell me that yours is gonna last. You can't? Okay, that's why I'm gonna stand on this rock. I'm not shaken by your new thing that you're trying to do. I'm not scared of it. And I don't have to be unsure of my own foundation because I know that it's good. Why? Because our teachers, our apostles, our prophets, they've been doing their job. That's why we can stand to those things. We won't be led astray by these things or deceivers or false doctrines. Verse 15, instead, we will remain strong and always sincere in our love as we express the truth. All of our direction and ministries will flow from Christ and lead us deeper into him, the anointed head of his body, the church. I love this as well. So the fivefold gifts, Christ descends and ascends, giving these gifts to the church. So Christ then, the ministry of Christ, which is the apest expressions. So when I'm being apostolic, when I'm being prophetic or evangelistic or teaching or shepherding, as I do those things, those are the ministries of the fivefold gifts. As I apply those ministries to the body of Christ, uh, well, sorry, so the gifts were given to the body of Christ. That's what it says. Jesus gave the gifts to the body of Christ. And as they're grown up, they experience the fullness of Christ. So they say, oh, this is who he is. This is awesome. Now we have to share that. So then our outward expression is the ministry of Christ. We perform the ministry that he has empowered us to do now that we have his fullness. So what do we do with the ministry of Christ? That ministers that either brings people into the body of Christ or builds up the body of Christ. And what does the body of Christ do? Well, it expresses the fullness of Christ as the ministry of Christ. And what does that do? That builds up the body of Christ. And what does the body of Christ do? Well, once they've achieved the fullness, then the ministry of Christ builds up the body of Christ. It's this cycle of maturity and blessing. The fullness of God, the fullness of Jesus Christ is meant to be an, a snowball effect. It just keeps going and it just keeps growing. Once that thing gets rolling, it just keeps ministering to itself in a beautiful picture. And that's when we say when God offered the fivefold gifts as worship to God, he's saying, I'm giving this back to you. And God says, great, I'm gonna bless you with more. More what? More of who you are, Jesus, more of the fivefold. That blesses the people who bless outwardly, who bless the people who bless outwardly. God's really big on these unending cycles of blessings. That's how he works. So one last thing, verse 16 for his body has been formed in his image and is closely joined together and constantly connected as one. And every member has been given divine gifts to contribute to the growth of all. And as these gifts operate effectively throughout the whole body, we are built up and made perfect in love. A couple of things on that. One, we've been closely joined together, constantly connected as one. How, your body has multiple systems in it. How would you do if I removed your circulatory system? How long do you think you're gonna make it? What if I remove your skeletal system? How are you gonna do? Not great. These things need to be integrated, part of the same body, the same way that Jesus needs lungs and a heart and a spine and muscle tissue and skin. The way that he needs those things, the church needs all of the fivefold gifts. And you are supposed to be connected. You might say, well, I don't like this fivefold thing. I'm out of here. We lose a spine, we got problems. Things aren't going to be great. So constantly connected. And every member has been given gifts to contribute. Every part of the body matters. You are a part of the body. You have a gift that you need from others. You need their gifts. And they need your gifts. And what I love too is it says that we'll be built up and made perfect in love. Now we talked a few weeks ago about what love is. Love is wanting. Well, So love is, is working for and praying for the absolute best in somebody's life. I want you to have the absolute best of everything. That is how I express love to you. What I love about this is that the apostle then, in their grace, they're going to give destiny and mission to people. That's how they're going to love them. That's how they're going to get the best from them. They're going to give them destiny. And then how is a prophet going to do this? Well, they're going to give you a connection to Christ that's going to be constantly sustaining where you can hear him. You know what he says about you. Your identity comes alive. The evangelist is going to give you inspiration, belonging, inviting you into the family of God and perspective of the good news of who God is at all times. They're going to help us keep that joy. And then the shepherd, they're going to give you family and community. They're going to help you learn from other people in a way that's healthy. And it's going to help you teach other ways, other people in ways that are healthy. 
And a teacher is going to give you truths and tools and foundational standing stones that you can count on. That is how we love people. When you say you want to love someone, if you want to be built up and made perfect in love, if you're only doing one of these things, we're missing the big picture. We've only got a couple colors. We're missing the many colored tapestry of God's grace. I want to love like this, and I want our church to love like this. I want us to love internally and externally with the fullness of who Christ is so that everyone around us can experience the fullness of Christ, be built up in maturity, made perfect in love, and experience the absolute best possible good that God has for you and for the people around us. So the only question there is, you guys on board? You ready to do this thing? That's good. Because now moving forward, as we dive in this five, we're going to talk about each one of these things specifically. What are they? How do we do that? How do we express this? What does it mean? How did Jesus perfectly model this? And how can I, in this unique grace, learn from the example of Christ and learn from my authority, learn from Scripture about how to operate in this gifting? Because when we're all doing this right, that is when the church really, truly looks and acts and sounds and feels and operates and experiences and crushes and changes this world the same way that Christ did. And we want the fullness of Christ here. So I would like you all to repeat this after me. It's kind of a declaration. If you are on board with me, I want you to say this with me. Heavenly Father, I accept the call to be your expression here on earth. I thank you for the gifts you've given me. I will freely offer what you have freely given me. I will fight for unity for the sake of myself and your church. That was a long one. Good job, guys. And I will work together, yeah, work together. with my spiritual brothers and sisters, with my spiritual brothers and sisters. To, see to see your purposes fulfilled on this earth. Congrats, everybody. We're a five-fold church now. Let's go, baby!